Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode four of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre, and with me is Z. Uh, we don't have Auntie with us today. He had to uh, do some other things. And uh, so we are not only a day late, but also 30 minutes late because we started the podcast and there was audio issues. Uh, it's all Z's fault, both of them. So we're going to start a coup d'etat. Both, both are absolutely <laughs> my fault. Um, what is this, uh, three out of four podcasts we've had some issues during? Yeah, I'm going to start writing you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the first t- time meetings. I just had Twitch open in the background, so everybody got to hear us twice. Uh, <laughs> this time I had you muted the entire time, effectively, so it was just me talking. I'm trying to take over this podcast. Yeah, yeah, he was just talking to himself the entire time. Crazy. Yeah, so I don't think we'll be uploading that, um, and I'm not sure we'll be <laughs> able to uh, reproduce our 20, 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, yeah. But... I mean, I mean we yeah, can still I'll, I'll bring it cover up. some of the topics. Yeah, so what we were talking about was uh, CTF stuff. So over the weekend, there was the Sunshine CTF, and I wanted to talk about it a little bit because it was it was a pretty cool CTF. Uh, there was a mix of you know easier and more difficult challenges. There was sadly only po- uh, two pwn challenges. I wish there was more than that, but you know, whatever. Uh, but. Yeah, I thought it was pretty fun. I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna try to play it again next year if they host it again next year. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit on the podcast about the second pwn challenge because I thought it was a bit interesting. It's not really an issue I've came across in the wild or anything. Uh, so the the crux of the challenge was that they had a, uh, like a mem copy or whatever the function call was that would use bad pointer arithmetic. So they'd use uh, the address of operator on a pointer instead of just passing the pointer directly. So you could like corrupt uh, a pointer on the stack that would get passed to system. So you could get command injection. And it was, it was pretty cool. Like it it was not something I really thought of before as an issue. Uh, Well, like, you know, it's obviously a contrived issue and it's not really something you'd come across in the wild, but uh, I thought it was still kind of interesting. I almost solved that challenge. Uh, I didn't fully, though. You know, so what I'm was noob. keeping you from solving it? Um, basically, <clears throat> you know, to to pass the string into command injection uh, or to system to get the like arbitrary command stuff, uh, you'd have to get a string in memory and then pass that pointer to it. Uh, my problem was like I couldn't really figure out how I was supposed to do that. There was another function in the binary that would and map some memory and copy data into it. Uh, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it, it mun mapped shortly after. I didn't realize at the time you could like go around the mun map. So like, what was your way around it? Or what was the uh, expected way around it? Since it sounds like you know a way around it now, but you didn't then. Yeah. So basically, uh, they had a bit of a red herring in the challenge. So when you uh, wrote to this mmap buffer, they actually said that it was, uh, they called it shellcode. And when you wrote there, they gave you a prompt that said, do you want to jump to this shellcode? And, you know, if you press yes, it would try to execute whatever you wrote into that buffer. Obviously, challenge wasn't Sounds that like easy. Sounds like an easy challenge. Yeah, you would think so. But uh, they had NX enabled uh, or, well... Not only that, but they mapped it with uh, read and write permissions, but not execute. So, you know, you couldn't use that directly to exploit it. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, I would always just put N for no, you know, to get past it. Uh, apparently, if you specified a character different than Y or N, it wouldn't take the path that would unmap the memory. I don't know how I didn't catch that when I was actually doing the challenge, but I didn't, so... Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just kind of look at those Boolean questions and don't really, you know, you expect it to do the normal thing. Look for one of the answers and then just assume anything that isn't that answer is false or is true. Or like, you know, something like that where, you know, there's just like the catch all. Yeah, obviously you should try it, but, you know, sometimes it just kind of skips by you. Yeah. I I didn't go too hard into the CTF. Like, I didn't know it was running until, like, a day into it or so. I, you know, 
I don't I don't play CTS too often. I'm trying to get more into them now. But yeah, I just I Yeah. It's just one of those things that I overlooked. Yeah, and the but, other challenge on that one was you said a fairly simple challenge. Uh yeah, the the first pwn challenge. Uh it was basically just a I'm pr- I'm pretty sure it was just like a gets into a buffer or something like that. It it wasn't too hard. It was called Return to Mania. And uh Oh yeah, they just scan f with percent %s and didn't use a width specifier, so you can just overwrite the return address. And they had a a win function in there, so it was a pretty straightforward exploit. It wasn't yeah, no else. shell code, nothing, just overwrite yeah. and return. <clears throat> yeah, not even any like uh like short ROP chains or anything like that. It was just a overwrite to a different function kind of thing. Yeah, just just your <clears throat> your pretty standard, you know, baby's first pwn. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, so those challenges were pretty cool. I'm going to probably play it again next year. It was definitely more of a beginner CTF. Like you know, you had not, uh, some write-ups that to that CTF, correct? <clears throat> yeah, I posted some write-ups on Yeah, you could probably uh, drop GitHub the link repo. in here, too. I don't think we're prepared to pull them up, but you know, I could share them at least. Yeah, I'll put them in chat, and we can put them uh, in the, the description yep. of the VOD later on, but... Uh, yeah, there was another cool challenge. Uh, sorry, did you want to say something there? I was just going to ask about the other challenges, other categories, because <laughs> I, I only played that one challenge you linked me, the uh, really the, the stupid web one. easy web one. Yeah. Yeah, so there was, there was that web one, it was just an SQLI, and it wasn't even blind, it was just, you know... Um, I mean, it wasn't super easy for me, because I don't do web stuff often, but it was super easy for you. <laughs> um, the... Yeah, the other kind of interesting challenge was the scripting time warp challenge. And uh, you mentioned it in the, you know, previous fail yeah, stream. Yeah, last but, uh... time we were trying to stream. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it reminded me a lot of your Robot City challenge when, uh, I don't remember who it was that actually solved it, but when your Robot City challenge um, had the first stage of this challenge had math questions that you had to solve. And somebody, I'm pretty sure you you seeded it correctly, I think, too. Like, seeded by time. Yeah. And somebody went about solving that one on... Or, sorry, you're, you didn't have the output set up correctly, so when it was running over the network, people would have to submit their answers before they got the question. And somebody <laughs> went and broke the randomness on that uh, in order to solve that part of your challenge, even though that wasn't actually supposed to be part of it. Sounds like this one was a little bit easier. Yeah, it, it was essentially like that. So you had to, you know, uh, submit the questions before, or like submit a number before it told you what the number was. And it would tell you the number after you submitted your number, whether it was correct or not. Uh, and yeah, but it, it wasn't seeded by time. It was seeded with a static seed that stayed the same throughout the whole CTF. And uh, and yeah, it was it was basically like my failed Robot City challenge, except you didn't have to guess the seed. So it was a little bit easier in that regard. Uh, I, you know, I put probably a little bit of stress on their server because they wanted 300 correct answers before they gave you the flag. And, uh, I didn't like break the seed or anything. I literally just, you know, tried solving it. If I failed, log the result, start again. So I submitted like 300 times, you know, whatever, however you would calculate that request. So it took like 30 uh, minutes for the script to run, but kind of walk through that last time but just you know take get whatever the answer is and then loop back through all the questions again you know answer giving all the correct answers that you know get one wrong you get the new answer add you just kind of solve one then two three four and keep going which is definitely a tedious way to do it you mentioned that the seed though was actually in the description uh in kind of a lead speak if you took all the numbers it would have given you the seed and i mean that's like i don't see any way somebody would have gotten that without any sort of hint it's like oh yeah there's numbers here that's probably the seed yeah it was a cool easter egg yeah um i i mean i guess you could kind of think that somebody would be able to guess that somebody might guess it like definitely somebody might guess it out there but i don't think you know it's I definitely won't rely on that as the means to solve it. So I imagine a lot of people oh, yeah, solved definitely. it exactly like you did, doing uh, you know, all of those requests there. Yeah, recursively. How many requests would that be? 
Like, uh, I guess it would technically just be 300 there that you have to go through. 300 so once you had all one. the correct answers. Yeah. But you'd have to, so if you got to one, and oh, then you true. got everything yeah. correct, you'd yeah. have to so. reconnect. So you'd have to do, like... So would that be, like, 300 factorial? Yeah, it would. Yeah, that's so, exactly Something like that. Math is hard, so... Yeah. I'll just say it's a big number, bigger than 300. Big, big number, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I imagine a lot of people will have solved it the same way. Yeah. Um, just before we kind of carry on into that, though, uh, some dude four, five, six just asked a question. Uh, what are your opinions on studying CTS as a way to get better uh, in exploiting real world applications? Do you think there are better alternatives? And I mean, the best way to this is just my answer. Now, the best way to get uh, better at exploiting exploiting real world applications is to exploit real world applications. That said, CTFs are kind of like these bite sized applications. So you end up with a situation where, you know, usually the challenges designers are inspired by something. Sometimes it's by something they've seen recently, like, you know, perhaps they, you know, do some of these assessments as their job or whatever, or, you know, by some named vulnerability that got really popular and they're inspired to create these challenges, usually with some sort of base in that. So these challenges are like, you don't need to waste the time, you know, spending weeks trying to find an entryway. You know, this program's vulnerable. You know, it's vulnerable in this small amount of code. And that I think makes CTFs a really good way uh, to learn. Obviously at first, like you're going to be stuck for a long time on challenges. Uh, you know, you may not solve them during the actual CTF, but it's a bite-sized way for you to get some of that practice. And while doing real world exploits, I think is even better. Um, and even just taking known exploits and recreating them yourself. But CTFs are absolutely a way to get that problem solving thought, just get some creativity into what you're doing, something kind of different. Because obviously, sometimes the CTFs are very, very contrived in what they do. Maybe you're not going to see that exact exploit there, but you're going to see something maybe similar, or at least that thought process that went into the exploit is going to help you later down the road. I think anything that gives you experience is going to help you ultimately. And CTFs, I think, are fairly efficient, or are a fairly efficient way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it depends a bit on the category too. Uh, Very true. Especially for like reversing Pwn and Web, I could definitely see CTFs being at least somewhat helpful. Uh, for like Pwn, for example, I don't think it's helpful for for vulnerability research because, like you said, the, the examples are very contrived. They're not generally they're not really bugs you're going to find in the wild. Uh, but for exploiting them, that is valuable because you know exploits can be you know you can kind of carry over knowledge from exploiting a certain scenario to another scenario. So if you if you've like exploited a stack overflow and written a ROP chain for a CTF challenge, that's going to be something you're going to do in the real world if you find a stack overflow and there's no like stack cookies or anything that get in the way. Um, so for exploiting and stuff like that, I think it is helpful. Uh, when you start getting into other categories though, uh, crypto, stego, forensics, I, I don't think so. Not really. Uh, crypto actually. So Oh no, so um, Stego is one of those challenges. I don't like Stego just because it often is one of those things where it's like you either know it or you know the tool or you have no idea and you're just Googling the entire time. Sometimes there's some really awesome Stego, uh, but um, uh, there was one guy who definitely made the argument of Stego being useful in terms of how people are like how attackers are actually exfiling data. Now, I've not worked on the blue team actually doing incident response, so I can't say for sure that this is the case, but he made the claim that uh, it was actually useful in doing that and useful as when he did red teaming uh, for ideas on how to hide data so it would get through like a, a filter or something like that. I always think there's probably easier ways, but at the same time, you know, if you're up against a really solid blue team, I could see there being some benefit there. I don't think it's, you know, the best way. I don't think it's usually really necessary if you run into it in the real world where you need Excel data. You can probably Google a little bit to come up with some idea and the CTF isn't going to be a big part of that. Uh, 
But I mean, that's also not really the question, which is, you know, exploiting real world applications. And I definitely agree. Like, I, I think the crypto challenges, that's the other thing I was going to mention. Crypto challenges often, they're not realistic in terms of how they're set up, but they give you an idea of the flaws that people can make in crypto really easily when they try to roll their own system and rolling your own crypto system doesn't mean writing your own like encryption primitives and like you know doing all like the low level xors and everything yourself in the crypto it just like even just using trying to set up uh aes properly on your own can actually like you can have a lot of things go wrong in that and crypto challenges kind of highlight a lot of the really obscure things that can go wrong are you going to run into it on like every program you test? No, of course not. Uh, but I've actually I found crypto useful just in the research you kind of do uh, while you're trying to solve some of them. You end up researching, you end up learning about flaws in the crypto that maybe you weren't aware of otherwise. And that's true with RE and that's true with Pwn challenges too. A lot of times like those dead ends, those failures that you have trying to solve these challenges for you know days and you get nowhere. The research you do during that is really useful too. And at least with CTF challenges, you always know there's an end in sight. You know, there is a solution to this. Or at least you hope there is a solution to it. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, the CTF had to fix some of their issues or... No, that was uh, the other one. That was, I'll talk okay. about that one we'll talk in a about minute. that a bit more um, later. But, but just to cap off that discussion a little bit, with crypto specifically, see, my issue is there's two kinds of challenges. There's the ones you were talking about, which deal with implementation flaws, which are kind of cool. Uh, one that I remember tackling before was the, was it PCB Oracle padding attack or C CCB? I can't remember the, what was it? Um, it was well, yeah, you're talking about the padding Oracle attack. Yeah. Uh, the one that was on the netcat.us site and now on our site. Yeah. 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 So, that was just padding Oracle attack. Yeah. So those challenges like that are cool. What I have an issue with is what I've noticed, at least in like more beginner CTFs, is they'll have challenges in the crypto category that just give you a string of garbage and you have to like you have to like figure out what the cipher even is. And it's just like it, that kind of goes on. That's kind of going into like Stego and forensics territory of it's not something you can figure out by just looking at it and like staring at it and, you know, you have to either already know it or you have to do a bunch of Googling to try to figure out like which cipher it is and guess. Yeah. And I mean, 90% of the time it's a rot N type thing, some type of rotation cipher with those early beginner challenges or base yeah. 64, like, or some base base 32 is one that gets tossed out there is like a tricky one to catch because everyone tries base 64 and fails. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, th but that's a hard thing to do with beginner crypto in general. Uh, yeah. Nonetheless, like, yeah, there definitely are kind of those two different types. Those I've rolled my own completely own crypto system. You've never seen exactly this before. And, you know, there's not a lot to go on. And then there's kind of, I think, more interesting crypto challenges that, that are based around real world flaws. Yeah. And it's worth knowing, like. You know, crypto stuff, maybe you're not going to get remote code execution from it, but you are going to get something out of it, like breaking the crypto. Uh, actually, I guess I can't really see you're going to get something. A lot of times a breaking crypto is almost just a mental masturbation. It feels good for you, <laughs> but you're not really. And you can report it, you're protecting data, but like you're not, you're not popping boxes with it. Um... So yeah, actually, I kind of have to recant a bit there. It's well, there I mean, it's, is one... it's valuable, but it's not valuable at like to the individual vulnerability research. I think it's valuable when you're working with a company trying to help them secure their data. Um, but usually, when people talk about trying to exploit real world applications, they're looking at uh. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I will say about crypto is, uh, by the way, if you want to fund CTF with uh, dealing with implementation flaws, you should try hacking Nintendo consoles. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to repeat there because I think I actually was muted. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, lots of issues going on here uh, with 
with the crypto, just in case I was muted during that. Um, a lot of it just is a bit of mental masturbation where it feels great to kind of find some of those issues, but the real world applications, like they're really difficult in the real, real world to pull off a lot of them unless you're able to get a lot of data. Uh, but they're great, like at the enterprise level, trying to protect that data when you do have a company that does have a lot of data. It's useful. You're just, you're not getting like RC or something from it. Yeah. And that, you know, repeating my point a little bit was if you want to do those kind of challenges, you should go into Nintendo console hacking. And that kind of segues into the point I was going to make where crypto is kind of useful, uh, especially for like DRM and stuff like that. If you want to break DRM, uh, crypto is a good target. Uh, yeah, I'll admit that. I didn't really think about that, but yeah. Yeah. So like consoles, you know, that's a really popular target. Like crypto's like the kind of the saving grace of console developers. You know, that's what they use as like their last light of defense. So breaking that is uh that's like the one area where I can see crypto being like big. Other than that, except for maybe like HTTP stuff, I yeah, it's it's not like I mean, there definitely are cases, like I said, kind of at the enterprise level where they are trying to protect this data. It's definitely yeah. useful to be aware of the issues and the research that goes into it. But, uh, you know, just tying this all together, uh, I think the best way, if you're talking simply about getting the exploit development experience and building the exploit, is to take real world applications that have known exploits uh, and try to reproduce that exploit. I think that's where you're going to learn a bunch of even even if you have to start by taking a walkthrough like somebody that's written up like you know taking one of specter's write-ups of an exploit start with that and implement it all on your own and kind of understand or uh, the term i like to use is grok or understand intuitively what's going on mm -hmm. uh i think that's the most efficient way to kind of get experience and get better at exploring real world applications is to actually do that even if you need to have a crutch to start with uh, CTFs are the bite-sized challenge. Uh, that's going to help you with the problem-solving aspects of it. Obviously, it is going to help with the exploit development. Like I think CTFs are a very fun way to go about it. It's a gamified way to go about it. So, like I definitely enjoy playing CTFs. I think they're a great way of getting experience. Are they the most efficient? I'm not sure. I'd say that, but they are useful. Like I wouldn't not recommend somebody play a CTF. Yeah, I think where they're the most helpful is just grasping concepts, right? Like just, you know, or not even just grasping, but maybe maybe demonstrating concepts for like, you know, okay, here's how a buffer overflow works. Here's a small challenge where you don't have to worry about other code interfering with your exploit and try to exploit it, right? So you just deal with the, like, you know, bare minimum of trying to exploit that. You don't have to worry about all the potential issues that could arise in a real world scenario yet, right? While you're learning it. And then once you've learned it and you've got the concept down, then you can go tackle real world software and, you know, worry about uh, other code potentially messing up your exploit. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of where that whole idea of it being bite sized comes into it. You yeah. know, you're left with a challenge that is intended usually to be solved in like a weekend. You know, maybe it will take you longer, maybe you don't solve it, but the intent is that this is something that can be solved in, you know, a weekend of effort, usually much less than that, usually, you know, at, at the longest, you know, 12, 16 hours of real effort going into the one challenge. And I mean, like, th that is, you know there's an answer. And yeah. that, like, compared to real world stuff, where it's like, I don't even know if this is actually vulnerable. I mean, it just <laughs> kind of takes a load off day. because you know, <laughs> yeah, because you know it's vulnerable. <clears throat> yeah, and you were uh, kind of bringing that up with the next CTF I was going to talk about, which is actually going on right now. So I'm not going to talk about technical details like I did with the first one, uh, but there's encrypt CTF going on right now, and uh, it started yesterday. Uh, it goes until tomorrow, and it's basically. <sighs> It's. I think it's another CTF that's supposed to be more beginner because uh, I've solved the a few reversing and a few pwn challenges, and the pwn challenges are like really easy. Uh, so if you're like if you're a listener and you're newer to uh, to exploits and the CTF's still going on, check it out. 
uh, the pwn challenges are actually kind of cool like they're you know they're accessible to those who are newer to it and they are kind of fun so uh but some of the other challenges <laughs> not so much um i you know we were talking a bit about it before but i think some of these challenges have that issue of guesswork uh they they expect you to guess some of some of the challenges uh like the the first web one you you were saying that you think it might be because we're missing something yeah i mean usually i don't i don't like to toss judgment there saying oh yeah it's just guesswork uh right off the bat i want to see how other people are solving it before i really kind of make that claim but yeah so that's really what is like 50 points or whatever on the web i think 50 is that yeah right? 50 yeah. yeah, fairly low count. Um, I looked at it briefly this morning when you linked it to me. Sounds like you've looked at it. I mean, it's it's quite likely that we're missing something really obvious on it. And that always happens. You know, you have the CTF. It's like you, you're looking there for all these complicated things. And it's just super obvious right in front of you. Like, it's probably go when you actually have to visit, like, somewhere space else.html or something. Yeah. Oh, uh, like... I mean, things like that, where it's like, okay, it's obvious after the fact. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so these these guys are newer organizers. Uh, the tournament's happening in India, so that's why the time zones are a bit odd for if you're, like, Eastern or anything like that. Uh, yeah, it's they are newer organizers, so I think the challenge is... I think they could do a better job of like telegraphing the challenges, if that makes sense. Uh, Cause like some of the challenges, they just have like a generic name and then a meme for the description. Like that, you know, that's kind of silly. Uh, at least have something for the description, maybe like have a meme string, but you know, it's, you know, has some sort of hint in there or something like that. Right. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, other... again, it really depends. Maybe it is a hint that's just going over our heads. Like, yeah. I haven't looked at any of the other, well, I mean, you linked one other challenge just before we started this, but other than that, I haven't really looked at their challenges. I mean, I, yeah. again, I like to think that they've, you know, done their due diligence, had people kind of blindly solve this. Obviously, people have solved the challenges. Some so, of them. <laughs> yeah, I guess you did mention here how <laughs> some of the challenges need to be fixed after you've spent, you know, a couple hours on them. Yeah, so the, the CTF opened at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern today, technically. Uh, and, you know, before, you know, I spent a few hours trying to solve a few challenges. I did solve a few challenges. Uh, but there was, like, one or two that I spent quite a little bit of time on, and I couldn't, like, figure out a solution. I Like, I was just kind of bashing my head against the wall like you do with CTFs. And, uh, you know, and I looked at it, and I clicked on the challenge, and there's zero solves for it, like, three hours after it started. And there's teams like DCUA in the CTF. So it kind of got me wondering, right? So I just went to bed, and then I woke up this morning, uh, went into their Discord and saw their announcements channel, and it turned out, like, you know, a few hours after I stopped uh, and to go to bed, they put out, like, four or five announcements that, like, four or five challenges were broken. And, you know, bug fixed, now it's good had a bug is now fixed like a bunch of challenges like that it's kind of kind of annoying when you put like an hour or two into trying to solve something and then you find out afterwards it wasn't even solvable at that point yeah and this one is a shorter ctf right you said it's only like 36 hours or so yeah i, th I think it's 36 to 48 or so somewhere around there well it's did you not say it ended at like 9 p.m or 9 a.m or something I can get the exact specifics. I'm just going to go on CTF. Yeah, either because I mean, if it's if it's 48 hours, that's a pretty standard length. But you know, 36, like you know, it's a shorter CTF. And okay, it, with it all is 48 these, hours. Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought last time you had mentioned a shorter period, but even at 48 hours, like with these timed CTFs, that's really rough when you have people trying to solve them for some hours, and they're not even solvable. Yeah. So, but uh, like you were mentioning before, you know, that is, I think, an issue with just be, uh, people that are new to organizing CTFs. Those issues are going to happen. Uh, hopefully, if they, you know, organize an another CTF next year, uh, they test those challenges and that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, it could <laughs> simply be a deployment issue. Like, there's a lot of ways that can happen that just get missed. It seems like a lot of times a lot of those mistakes are the things that you make that mistake once. 
then you don't make it again. You might make a, like you might make that same overall idea where the challenge doesn't work again, but it's probably going to be in a different way. At least I, I'd like to say that, but if we take my experience with running this podcast, <laughs> maybe not. But um, I, I would like to be hopeful that, you know, give them a few more CTFs under their belt. Looks like this was their first one. You know, it'll improve. And I mean, yeah. it does take time. Like, I know some of the first challenges I ever built uh, maybe weren't the most straightforward to solve. And it's just over time, getting that experience with judging the challenges, understanding kind of how pe other people are going to approach them. I've, I've improved at that a bit, you know, where I have less challenges coming back to me needing to be like majorly revamped because I completely missed something obvious. It's always yeah. going to happen, but just, you know, with experience, getting other people playing the stuff, it gets better. And I imagine that'll be the same for these guys as long as they, you know, keep it up. I imagine it'll look better in the future, but at least at this point, things don't look all that good for them. Er, but maybe it is just us being stupid. Except for yeah, the ones where I mean, they've actually said there are bugs, but in terms of the ones that, you know, we're just not getting. Yeah, I think to before we can cast judgment, we'll need to see, you know, write-ups and stuff that get posted yeah. to see how some of these get solved by people. Uh, yeah, how people yeah. solve them and what the intended solution was. Yeah, that as well, yeah. So um, moving away from, you know, the more standard, easier CTFs, uh, we have another CTF that we should have talked about on the last podcast, but, you know, we didn't. Uh, it actually ended on the day of the last podcast. I can't remember if it ended before we started the podcast or not. I, I think it did, but we just, uh, we didn't, you know, have time to talk about it in that podcast. Uh, so Pwned Own happened, Pwned Own 2019. It was hosted in Vancouver. And <clears throat> I figured I'd talk a little bit about Pwned Own. Because it is pretty interesting. Uh, so, <laughs> did you follow Pwned Own at all? See? Uh, no, I usually just end up following. Like, I know you had shared a little bit about what was going on, but usually, like, my interaction with Pwned Own is just the aftermath of it. Like, just kind of that overview. I don't really follow the actual uh, CTF, if you want to call that. Like, that I don't really pay attention to. Like, maybe I'll see the tweets, but... Uh, yeah. I don't I don't follow it in depth and I didn't follow it in depth this year. Yeah, so I followed it a little bit as much as, you know, I could from the outside, right? There's not really like a, a viewing or visuals or anything like that. It's pretty much just watching their Twitter. And uh, you know, uh a friend of mine, QWERTY, was participating in it, so I was a bit interested in it. But when I looked at the so Pwned Own they post a schedule, like they have uh the days, like a a layout of the days, right? So they have two days. And then they have time slots, the team that's participating and what they're trying to do, basically. And uh, when I looked at that sheet that they had online, there was like five times as many slots for this team named Fluoroacetate as there was for any other team. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, you, you probably knew who was going to win before it ended. And uh, yeah, you know, as you can probably guess, this team basically plowed through uh, Pwn to Own. Like the, the, <laughs> the amount of money they won was insane. I think they succeeded in every uh, attempt that they tried. Do you know if there were any categories that they didn't try in? Um, I don't. Um, I I can try Pwned Own 2019. Because <clears throat> they update the schedule page a little bit. And I, I might be able to see it on here. Uh, let me just see. I don't know if this has the actual. Yeah, so that's some of the prizes they were handing out. Uh, yeah, I don't think they have the results on this page. I think this. Yeah, this one I mean, if you don't schedule, know, that's but... fine. I mean, it's it's a minor yeah, detail. Just... It just sounds like they uh, yeah, had so... a lot of attempts. So here it is. So you can see success, 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 success. Uh, success, 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 success. <laughs> like, yeah, they succeeded in every attempt that they tried. Uh, and one of them was the uh, Tesla Model 3. So this year, Tesla decided to, you know, throw their hat into Pwned Own, and they gave away a, a new Tesla Model 3 to a team that managed to hack their car, uh, the, the Model 3. Uh, 
and that's what this article is about here. Side note here, I def I definitely heard about this, and I've heard you know Tesla, you know, giving away the Model Three to whoever wins. But at the same time, you have to hack the Model Three to win yeah. the Model Three. <laughs> that's true. I never. Even I mean, it. That. It's one of the things with I've. I mean, I've had a passing interest in looking at the vehicle hacking. Uh, I mean, I've looked a little bit at it, you know, looking at uh, the architecture that goes on there. It's it's just been a passing interest, but I mean, like you see, okay, Tesla's giving away, but then it's like you can't really research this without already having the capital to go get a Tesla, which at least I don't. And I mean, in Saskatchewan, a Tesla isn't a very practical option. <laughs> Anywhere in Canada, well... Uh, I mean, maybe that's not true, but in, in Toronto, <laughs> somewhere like that, it's definitely better. And I'm, to be fair, there are some chargers around me, not superchargers, but places that do offer uh, the charging. So, like, there's the option. It's like two hours away, but there is the option. Yeah. Um, my other question is um, there's two people on the team. So, how do you split a Tesla Model 3? <laughs> in half. <laughs> you just sell it and split the money, or like. Well, that or I mean, they probably already had one in order to do the testing to find the exploit anyhow. Yeah, it's true. So one gets one, one gets the other. I mean, that's just kind of internal team dynamics. I mean, perhaps yeah. they perhaps they sell it. Perhaps they have something else to do with it. I don't know. But I mean, it's. There's ways that it could be done. I mean, it's all it all comes down to the team dynamics. Yeah. Uh, the the thing I thought that was kind of interesting about the the hack though was that the entry point happened through the web browser, of course. Uh, and for some of you that don't know, you know, and, and stuff like consoles, uh, the web browser is the Achilles heel. Like, if if you have a console that has a web browser, it's gonna get pwned at some point. Like, that's that's the go to for anybody, right? Um, and it, apparently that's the go-to for car hacking too. <laughs> because, yeah, like you know, the whole infotainment like, system is a really common target for any of the car hacking stuff. Yeah. I mean, because you start there and then obviously you eventually, my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, is you want to be able to pivot onto the CAN bus. And if once you're on the CAN bus, you can do everything that you can. Sorry, uh, what's the CAN bus? The CAN bus is basically the messaging bus for like... You know, apply brakes, turn wheel, all of that, uh, okay. depending on how much is digitized. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, so I may be mistaken, but my understanding is all the messages of all the electronic systems pass through that message bus, which is called the CAN bus. Okay. Um, again, I don't want to make the claim that's definitely how it is, but that is my understanding of it. And usually the ideal case is that the infotainment system, the Wi-Fi, is a separate system. So yeah, you have I to find so. some way to bridge between them. Um, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, it, they're supposed to be separate, but I just kind of recall back to the... Uh, who was it? Was it... I want to say it was Kaminsky. I probably didn't say his name right, but uh, Dan, who uh, did the last kind of vehicle hack over remote Wi-Fi. Uh, I oh, think it yeah, was a okay. Jeep. You know what I'm talking about there, the... I, yeah, I, th I think I know which one you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, it was over, like, over the ATT network. Yeah. Okay, I definitely... I definitely had the wrong name there. Um, oh, okay, what was the name? Uh, Charlie Miller. Oh, okay, not, not even close, okay. <laughs> well, not uh, close, but another name that, uh, you know, is pretty familiar for security researchers. Like, he's... I'm sure he's spoken at DEF CON quite a number of times, as so so as Dan. Like they both. Yeah, I, th I think so I, like I knew it was a. Uh, I yeah. knew it was uh, one of those well-known uh, security researchers, but obviously I had the wrong <laughs> name. Uh, either way, I mean, basically what their attack was, they introduced the vulnerability, I believe. Uh, into the system only because they had found a bunch but didn't actually want to do the exploit on them okay. uh, but essentially they had like the whole wi-fi system connect over the wi-fi and they were able to get into the can bus from there yeah i mean so it's supposed to be separate it sounds like on a lot of vehicles it's really not like there's some bridge between them 
Yeah, I tried to find a little bit more information on that because I was thinking that too, right? I was thinking web browser, okay, cool. But generally, you know, the web browser is going to be isolated from the system controlling the car, I would hope. Uh, but I didn't see anything about that. And that's probably on purpose. They probably limited the amount of information that got out about it because you don't really want people uh, <laughs> using that information to try to hack cars. I mean, if themselves. you're doing this, it's probably already known. Like that you yeah. can just exploit this infotainment system and kind of get to the rest, especially like Tesla is a pretty digital system usually, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know enough. Like I've never actually tried any exploits on a vehicle, so. Yeah, I haven't either. It's, it's one of those areas. I remember there was actually a CTF ran, I think. A year or two ago, I forget what it was called, but they basically sent you like a a little Raspberry Pi or whatever it was, and it had like a fake uh, vehicle system on it that you would try to hack. Uh, a friend of mine participated in it, but I didn't like. Actually, it, that it was might a lot have of hardware been stuff. I forget what it was that called. That, that uh, yeah, had I that. What it was called. Uh, either way, I'm not. Like I said I don't think either of us are going to be pull up here now either. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tesla obviously got pwned, as did many other things by, uh, by this team. Yeah, fluoroacetate OP. Uh, so you know there was that Tesla hack, and then you also brought up uh something. Uh, yeah, just so recently. kind of taking a little bit more of the news aspect here. Um, I mean, the gist of this was is another Tesla hack. Uh, but one day up happening is that um, essentially stickers on the road caused the Tesla autopilot to think that the lane was in a different location. So it would, of course, go and adjust itself and start driving in the, long, uh, in the wrong lane because uh, there's your lane. That's super I mean, good. And that's, that's what <laughs> I think happens, though, with a lot of these AI systems where we don't... They're black boxes, in a sense. You know, they develop some way of identifying something you know we train them on this data they identify the certain trigger a certain signal um and then that's kind of you know what it uses and we don't really know what that signal is for it yeah um and in this case you know they basically like I said have stickers and that was enough of a signal for it to think it's late and that's where a lot of ai systems they work really well in normal situations but it seems like adversarial uh, in like the adversarial context, if something's <clears throat> malicious about it, they're not trained on malicious data. They're not trained on detecting that malicious data. Yeah, and I mean, even non-malicious data, like, you know, I've always wondered with the uh, auto driving cars that detect lanes and stuff. Like, how does that shit work in, like, the snow? You know, that's a big question where, I, you know, where we live in Canada. <laughs> that's going to be an issue, right? Like, you know, because I, I would think that it had, like, se sensors on the bottom of the car that would detect the lines on the road. And if there's snow all over the road and it's not been plowed or something like that, then how, like, it's not going to be able to get that data, right? Like, No, and I think just... a lot of them right now do have restrictions. Like, if it can make the lane detection, it just doesn't try to like it just doesn't work yeah so i mean it, it's just one of those things where it's like yeah you're right if you live in like california where it's always sunny and something like it, it probably works great uh in other parts of the world uh like canada where you get snow or if there's malicious you know something malicious going on behind it it's or just a bright light coming towards you is another thing uh driving yeah. in the sunlight uh, just because as a spirit 532 just mentioned there you know all of the ai lane sensing is vision based so anytime that vision is compromised uh you know it's going to be compromised oh, okay and, and he also put there the the way that it looks for snow is that it looks for the tracks that the cars melt through yeah, so that's actually so, I mean, kind of cool. I didn't know that. There, there are ways around that. Obviously, like they're trying to make these work in almost every situation. Yeah. But as we kind of tie it with this, so like, what about the malicious situations and the training on that? 
I mean, yeah. a lot of AI systems are just kind of these black boxes. They, they're they trained on data. They come up with these ideas on how the data relates and like what it can look for. But you've kind of probably seen those pictures of static that get identified as some random animal. And like, there's nothing that we as humans would look at and see like, oh yeah, I totally see a gorilla in this bunch of static. <laughs> but the AI being just that's this black Harambe box went. comes up with something. And yeah. that's where... Uh, there are some uh, attempts to make an uh, explainable AI. And yeah. I think, th I don't know if that'll help. My guess is that that might, at least in terms of being able to look at the end results and kind of see how it's making these determinations. Yeah. Uh, so going back a little bit to what you were talking about before, I didn't notice this. This document actually has a little bit about what you were talking about with the web browser. So this diagram shows that they exploit the web browser and then go to kernel and then using the kernel they bridge that gap to get to the can bus uh, so that that makes sense like that you know that's probably what i would have guessed but yeah i thought that like was interesting to bring up pretty high level though bypass app armor can be seems like a very magical hand wave uh, I mean, <laughs> app armor isn't exact i mean unless it's just really weakly set up or they find an issue you know that's allowed by app armor like it's just kind of bypass it no nothing more um yeah it's easy <laughs> so uh, to I be guess... fair i i don't know much about app app armor app uh, armor I... it's uh essentially it's used to lock down a program you give it rules like it's allowed to access these files it's allowed to do these things read in this directory whatever you give it a profile and then it's restricted to doing that at the kernel level um, okay it was actually i might be wrong about my history here uh although spirits mentioning that it's extremely weak um so perhaps it's not as uh secure as i uh believed it to be um i'll have to look into that but uh my experience with it uh i guess thinking about it i was more setting up profiles and actually trying to get around them so perhaps there are some really trivial bypasses that are there oh yeah uh did did we want to go back on that question that some dude posted by the way because i think we kind of skipped over it oh i, I still want stuff. to get on to that i was going to do it once we were kind of done with you were going to do what sorry you... oh i was going to move on to that once we were done with kind of just talking about this particular paper but yeah okay. i mean we can jump on to it uh basic question here rather than reading all of it out is uh, what type of mentality do we adopt when we're looking for vulnerabilities? How do we choose and assess a target that seems vulnerable? And at least for me, I tend to start out by kind of doing a threat model of the application. I look at what are the biggest threats to, like what, what assets does it have to protect? Uh, what are the biggest threats to the user and to the owner and maintainer of the software? Um, and I kind of use that to have a base of what are going to be kind of the jackpot areas to target. Uh, that isn't really telling me what's going to be vulnerable, but it's giving me, on an assessment, I'm going to focus in on a lot of those big issues first. Uh, in terms of like what's going to be vulnerable, what doesn't seem right, that just, I think, comes from a lot of experience of just sitting there and like, okay, I've seen like 20 applications in the last year that have all made the same smallish mistake yeah and then it's like okay well why don't i try this one with that same mistake see if they did the same thing and just kind of having that intuition about this doesn't quite feel right uh, and obviously intuition can be wrong at times uh but i think a lot of it is just intuition it's just i have the experience kind of say this seems a little bit odd so i'm going to start looking at it and I'm just kind of using that information along with kind of how I've modeled the application of, and when I go through the thread modeling, I'm also looking at what does the application do, like all of its functionality. And is there anything that either seems like a really weird function, like it was a feature creep that just kind of got added in there when it shouldn't have been. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, cause those things are more likely in my experience to be vulnerable than core functionality. So yeah. it's those little things that, again, it's kind of some intuition there with, you know, this just seems wrong. 
At least that's kind of how I approach it. If you want to uh, talk about your kind of approach, Spectre. Yeah, I mean, if you have, it depends on, I guess, what angle you come at it from. If you're talking about source code, um, generally, I try to when I try to assess something, I will I'll look for source code that looks like it it's not audited a lot, right? Like, uh, I I mainly do kernel stuff, so I'll I'll use that as an example. Obviously, it's going to be a bit different for cars and stuff, but, um, you know. I'm not going to look at the file that contains like the open system call implementation, for example, right? Because people use that every day. Uh, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to find a bug there. You might, but it's just a low chance. Um, I, I try to look at areas that look like they wouldn't be used often by people. Uh, so, uh, you know, like drivers, for example, like accessibility drivers, those are great to look at because typically their code quality is not as great. They're not audited as well and they're not used often so it's you know uh that kind of relates back to the point of it not being audited very well um in cars there's probably areas like that too um i'm just not really sure what they'd be because i don't really do any vehicle hacking uh but the other thing you mentioned was how the browser is always a thing to get pwned how do you know that how do you know this it's just browsers are notorious for uh exploiting especially in like consoles and anything embedded really anything that has a browser that's like a good target and one of the reason is one of the reasons is is it's browsers are very complex like some browser engines uh, like javascript engines i would say are more complex than operating systems because they have to deal with so many like conditions uh and especially where you have the garbage collector and stuff like that and you start introducing threading there's just so many like small issues that can pop up that can propagate into code execution. So that's why if there's like a browser, uh, it's it's more likely the weak point of the system than probably any other component. It's just a lot easier to hit. And then there's also the fact that, you know, uh, with WebKit, for example, you have Google Project Zero, they're looking at WebKit and they'll drop uh, reports after like 90 day disclosure deadlines or after it's been patched or whatnot and web browsers especially on you know like non-desktop systems it's not too uncommon for them to be outdated like they're not on the latest version so end days are also a lot easier to exploit on browsers i think yeah it's maybe worth knowing like a browser is also kind of a nice target just because it's reasonably well documented um, yeah. I mean, maybe it's not open source, but browser attacks are a common thing. So you can then apply a lot of that knowledge. Like it could just be that people have had personal experience with browsers. And so they've always attacked that. And so that kind of became the tradition is to go through the browser, even though there are other mechanisms. Similarly, like the audio file formats and stuff, just for general looking at the infotainment system. They're well known, so they're really easy areas to start fuzzing on because, you know, probably going into you maybe know a bit about those uh, formats already. So you can start fuzzing, you can start doing things really quickly. Uh, so some of that is just also personal experience on where you've looked before uh, to kind of just decide where you're going to look here or at least start looking. I mean, maybe yeah. you have to do research after you've kind of gotten started, but uh, at least for your initial thing, like you kind of go with what's familiar too. Um, I, that doesn't really answer how you obtain that intuition. It's just, I mean, I guess the answer on that though is how do you obtain any intuition is just from experience. It's just, you know, get there and try it. Yeah, you just have to jump into it. Like it, it's just one of those things where like you can read papers, especially with browsers. The go-to one is the attacking JavaScript engines by uh, Salo. But, uh, you know, you can read all you want, but to actually gain the intuition, you need to actually, you know, play around with it <clears throat> to get that experience. And tagging on a little bit to the end uh, of that discussion is another reason why WebKit is a like really nice target for attackers is because when when you're when you have an exploit, you literally have an entire language to play with. So it's a lot easier to create primitives to work with that can benefit you. So for example, if you have like if you pwn like a, a game or something like that, 
if you don't like some bugs may be unexploitable because you don't you just don't have the means to get the data into memory or something stupid like that whereas with webkit you have so many primitives to do stuff like that where like it's hard to have a bug that's not exploitable in webkit so that's what that's another reason why it's kind of a juicy target for attackers but uh yeah did you have anything more to add no, on to that no here? nothing to okay. add on i think that okay i mean uh you're welcome to ask another question if that didn't quite answer it for you uh, yeah. Wrapping up with this one, I mean, essentially it just came down to, you know, the AI isn't trained with malicious input or thinking about malicious input. Or maybe it is. I actually don't know exactly how they do the training. Yeah. But it seems like there have been a number of cases where uh, the AI can just be broken or has weird responses. Like I said, having that just noise and that fuzzy noise data and it sees something in that that like no human sees and yeah. explainable ai might might help with that it might not i don't know uh it would at least give us insight into how it's making these decisions compared to what we're kind of seeing now and i think that's kind of going to be one of the key things going forward is the ai might work in a lot of normal situations uh but we might start seeing more of these malicious cases where it makes really weird decisions. I think we had a discussion, though, about AI a couple... The last podcast. Was it on the last yeah. one? I... Yeah, okay. we, we discussed... I thought we uh, talked about it on the first one, too. I think we did a little bit, but I know on the last podcast we talked about, like, CNN poisoning and stuff like that. Yes. Or, yeah. So... Yeah, there, there's more uh, information, like technical stuff about that in the in the last podcast, if you guys want to check that out. Uh, but I think we, we can move on to the Ghidra. Uh, yeah, kind of get into some of these releases that have come out lately. So Ghidra 9.0.1, they have uh, removed the back door, presumably put in another one. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they um, and they fixed the one. XXE that we had talked about in one of the past podcasts also. Yeah, uh, so it is kind of interesting like uh you know it's an interesting thing to know about but a lot of it does seem to be just bug fixes like you said they fixed that xxe uh yeah i mean it's just the minor revision there the 9.0.1 going up yeah uh so there there are a few improvements uh the the, the sad thing is I don't see anything about some of the issues that we brought up, I think, in the first podcast. You know, like, uh, for example, the one with the uh, int3 instruction that would just stop disassembling. Um, I don't see anything about those kinds of issues. So Although with that, be... you could just uh, push a button to get to go forward. And I think that might have also been fixed if you use the... Uh, there's a setting in there for, like, aggressively look for instructions. Okay. I think that helped with it also. Oh, okay. uh, I have to go back and actually confirm that, but I believe there was a setting that uh, basically just had it kind of forced through some of those situations. Yeah. Although it does look like, at least in some cases, the undefined modes, it looks like they've added some instruction to codes there. Yeah. So it looks like they've added some. Obviously, that's not quite the same issue, but I yeah. think the big thing is they fi fix the... Uh, jdwp port and the xxc yeah uh the other thing with ghidra is sadly as far as i know unless it like just recently happened i still don't think they put out the decompiler sources have they no i i'm not sure when they're <laughs> yeah. planning to they haven't put out the source in general or at least yeah. they hadn't when i was looking at this yeah, I mean, some of the Java source is in the download, but it's not up on Yeah, the but that, yeah. that's not enough. And I believe they do plan to release the full source. Yeah, but I really they hope definitely so. haven't yet. I believe they mentioned that like during the RSA presentation that they do plan to release the source. So, yeah. I mean, I think we can expect it, but, you know, maybe like it'll a be month, a month man. or two or. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we just wanted to touch on that there's not too much yeah. to talk about there it's mostly bug fixes uh, mostly bug fixes nothing huge but you know the back door is gone i think that's important so yeah with the next one here i think coming up is the 
Commando VM, which yeah. is from the people that make the Flare VM. So it's a Windows VM with generally like some of your standard offensive tools. Um, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, yeah, I saw it described as basically like the Kali for Windows. Is basically yeah, I don't. I, saw it I mean, that like with all the tools and stuff like that, like Nmap, Wireshark, you know. It has those. Kind of I mean, it also has like the Sys internal stuff. Um, I mean, I haven't gone through everything, but it's similar to Kali. But I think one key thing is this isn't live. Like, you can't just put this on a DVD, go into a client site, boot it up. This is a VM. Okay, that's fair. And it definitely has that feeling to it uh, in terms of the tools that are on it. This is something where like somebody who does this work is going to have a VM with these tools already installed they can kind of work from. And then, you know, you finish up an assessment, go back on your snapshot to what do you kind of have to the clean snapshot or go back to the clean image. This is maintained. So presumably, you know, you'll see the updates on there with things like that so you don't have to worry about remembering to do all of that uh, yeah. which kind of makes it nice like i do run a number of these tools in a vm uh, i yeah. did find one interesting thing i did find it interesting is that it defaults the default install includes go installed yeah go that was an Python. interesting choice like i'm not go just as a language it's been interesting it's seen a lot more adoption lately and i think it's interesting that they've chosen to include it here like i don't I think it makes sense, but it also surprised me a bit when I saw that. Yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, on the reverse engineering server for April Fools, uh, we were like, uh, I'm sure you saw we 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 modified the RE bot that I wrote to like put out a bunch of like unhelpful tips, uh, like every hour or whatever it was. And okay. one of the things we made it say was uh, that uh, made your plan for Go going forward was to be used for infosec tools. <laughs> So that's, you know, it's kind of funny. It's kind of. And I mean, I have actually it. seen kind of more releases with InfoSec tools. Um, at least I've seen more. I've stumbled across more GitHub repos that are in Go. I, I have no names to kind of really mention. I'm sure there are some, but. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, the one thing that's nice with Go is I actually did use it for making a CTF tool. So there was a CTF challenge where it was it was dealing with a, a type juggling issue with PHP. Uh, so they did like a MD5 or whatever it was. Yeah, uh, magic but they did hashes. A double, yeah, but they did a double equals instead of a triple equals. And Python is generally your go-to scripting language for stuff like that. Uh, but there are some, like Python's slow. Generally, that doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. In that case, it actually did because it was it was kind of like brute forcing the hash that would give a magic hash. And uh, so Python took like 40 or 50 minutes before it even came up with anything, whereas Go took like two or three minutes. Uh, that is one like area where I think Go has a place is yeah, where I mean, performance has, is more of an issue. It, it, it goes. has better performance. And I mean, it feels like you're kind of writing a scripting language. It has some weird things to it. But it also feels very much like a dynamically typed language. Yeah, it's, um, it's very mean, it's high not, level. But it has that feeling, and that's definitely kind of a benefit for it. Uh, I've had a really similar experience with it. Um, it was a crypto challenge, actually, but it involved brute forcing part of like half of the key. Um, and yeah, I started in Python took forever and while the Python thing was running, I rewrote it in Go and had the answer in like 30 seconds. Before the Python script even finished. Yeah, before the Python script even finished. Uh, but yeah, going back on this, like, um, it is kind of a Kali for Windows. I can't see it getting used like, like Kali has. I mean, the thing is, I use Windows kind of on a day to day, but Windows definitely has some significant limits. I think the real key thing for any type of pen testing work is raw sockets. You don't have raw sockets on Windows. You just don't have them. You can have like libpcap and then you can get that. But Windows itself doesn't support that. So that's where you get things like just messing around at that level, the packet level. Uh, you just can't do that on Windows by default. 
Yeah. Um, and at least that's one of the big things for me. I mean, like I said, you do have lip PCAP, so you can do it. Um, it's just... It's just another thing you need to install to be able to do something that should be... like. Yeah, and presumably this has it installed already, to be fair. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's, no, it's not a first-class citizen like it is in on a Linux machine. So, I mean, yeah. I could definitely see myself possibly using this. Like, I already kind of have my own VMs established that I use. I, I might check it out in the future. I haven't checked it out during this last week. Uh, okay. But, I mean, it has a number of useful tools there. Like, it kind of has what you'd expect it to have. Obviously, uh, we show the list there, a bit of it, but there's 140 tools in there. Includes much of what you think. Feels a little bit different than Kali to me. Like, it feels more... Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for. It almost feels a little bit more professional, but, I mean, at the same time, it's a lot of the same things. Nmap, burp, uh, hashcat. Like, I mean, there's a lot of the same, too. But with it not being live, I don't think it's going to become a Kali replacement. It's definitely a VM. It's intended more towards... I mean, Kali, I guess, is also kind of intended towards professionals, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get what you kind of mean. Like, I didn't really think about that before. Was the, the Like, I don't really use Kali, but yeah, I kind of forgot that it, it is mainly for, like, live deployment on a USB or something and boot into it. Whereas I mean, a lot of people do install it as their primary operating system. You're not a true hacker if you don't run Kali. It's, it's a known fact. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. I, won't, I won't disagree with you there. <laughs> uh but yeah we thought we'd bring it up it it looks interesting uh yeah we'll have to look into it more uh yeah like i said it's definitely something that i could see myself possibly using in place of the vms that i already have at the same time i already have my own vm so it's going to be hard to get me off of that yeah yeah so and then the point. other release that's going to come out this last week is the POC or gtfo you uh, say POC? Well, I, proof of concept, but... I've never I heard anyone call it POC, to be honest. <laughs> I, I didn't know you called it that. I've always said POC. Oh, yeah. No, I, I definitely <laughs> say POC. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. I never noticed that. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Go on. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, yeah, I was just going to mention, like, obviously, we're not going to talk about every article in here. Uh, but I will say that I did enjoy giving the uh, inside the emulator of Windows Defender... I thought that was just kind of like an interesting little article to basically give a read on. And it's it's pretty much exactly what's written on the box. It dives into the uh, Windows Defender emulator. It was just kind of an interesting uh, read. And I mean, like yeah. I said, we're not going to dive through all these articles here. I just figured I'd point out kind of that one as one of my favorites from uh, this release. And the CSV injection was... It used a fun little... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I tried reading it, but I didn't really understand what they were trying to say. It was it was worded kind of weird. Maybe you could elaborate. Yeah, I, I, I could get that. Essentially, um, with CSV injection, you're usually, first of all, comma-separate values. It's basically you inject like macros into CSV files. Somebody opens it up in Excel, and Excel hopefully runs it. Um... Think of it kind of like, uh, I mean, I want to say kind of like an XSS, except instead of JavaScript in the browser, it's macros into an Excel document or a CSV that's being read. Uh, so what this thing did is essentially normally with these, you're going to get that low warning as you open it up being like, hey, there's remote content in here that it's trying to execute. Do you want to allow it to? Um, and essentially this just had a trick of using the of formatting your injection like an email address. So as it parsed it, it ends up parsing it as an email address and not as a macro. But then when the CSV parser goes, it parses it as like an equation. Oh, um, that's pretty cool. So yeah, okay. I thought it was kind of interesting. I again, I just kind of read it. I didn't go give it a try myself. It's possible that that's been fixed already. I imagine this is something that could definitely get patched pretty easily. Yeah. But I mean, it was just... I have a fun little read, and CSV injection is definitely undervalued in terms of what you can do with that. And it is more limited than like XSS. It does require user interaction of downloading and opening that. 
but yeah. with so many applications that do export to CSV, I mean, I've reported this issue a ton of times. Like, I can't even count how many times I've seen this. Okay. How useful is it? Who's to say, but... It's definitely an actual issue that's out there. And I thought that was kind of a fun read. Yeah. So the one that I read was uh, Undefining the ARM. So I, I don't work with ARM too much, right? I'm, I'm more into x86 and, and AMD64 and whatnot. Um, but I thought it, it had some cool things. So it was basically talking about how ARM, uh, you know, so they, there's the dot text segment. And typically when you're talking about dot text, you only expect code to be there, really. Uh, but in ARM, dot text has some non-code related values for li uh, literals. So let's say you're loading like a register, like R1 or whatever, with a value. You know, because it's a risk instruction set, the instructions are a fixed size. So they're always going to be 32 bits in size which means that if your value that you're trying to load into it is more than, uh, you know, three bytes or whatever it is, like, you know, if it's more than what the opcodes provide, then it, it has to do some tricks to, to get that value in there because of that fixed instruction limit. And it was basically how ARM does that is through the text segment. And this article talked about how uh, you could basically use that to hide instructions that when executed would be executed as code but when you went to like disassemble them or something like that uh the disassembler would skip over it so i thought that was kind of uh kind of interesting uh, sounds like that could be used for a ctf challenge a yeah RE that would challenge. be pretty cool yeah yeah it, it seemed like a pretty cool article uh th that was probably the only one that i read too much of though it's like some of the other ones uh, I read a little bit of the steganography and ICO files. That was kind of kind of interesting. I was talking about using like uh, colors that weren't parsed or something like that. Uh, but I don't understand enough about image formats to really elaborate on it too much. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I haven't read everything in it either. It's yeah. definitely some of the articles can be pretty dense to walk through. Yeah. I mean, they're comes out like it doesn't come out super often so you know when they do it's worth taking the time to kind of go through it on your own yeah i'm I'm not too familiar with poc or get the fuck out but i'm pretty sure it uh uh i saw some of the articles they used like old english or something I, I i don't know if that's like a ongoing thing with it uh possibly Did just the particular that? author yeah okay uh but um uh, it wasn't this one, but I think two issues ago, uh, you could basically open up the PDF as like an MP3 and has like a bunch of different file formats. Like they do some interesting stuff. Huh. Okay. Um, might even but, uh, be mentioned if you scroll off, but yeah, I mean, new release, so yeah. Definitely check it out. There's there is some cool articles in there. Obviously, you don't have to read them all. You know, just read the ones that are interesting to you. But I wanted to bring it up because, like you said, it's kind of a rare thing. Yes, yeah, kind of our personal day. interesting articles. Uh, yeah. yeah. So moving on from that, uh, there's uh, some more news that we should have covered in the last podcast, but we didn't. Uh, yeah, so we're the cover it in this one. Asus backdoor here. Uh, essentially somebody was able to or a group of people were able to digitally sign uh backdoored uh the asus live update tool which is basically a tool running on like their laptops looking for updates of their whatever software they deploy with their laptops or i assume like you can get for the motherboard i'm not actually sure about that but essentially the idea is this tool is looking for updates and they were able to backdoor the update checking tool using one of the company's own code signing certificates push that to their download servers and you know everybody was backdoored at that point um the backdoor itself though was fairly targeted uh it only scanned yeah, for some like 600 mac addresses as like the confirmation on who to attack so that honestly sounds to me like nation state targeting somebody yep. i don't know if it is i obviously can't make any claim could there could be some other reason you know maybe that is the russian mob going after some 
of particular <laughs> business interests. I mean, it could be a bunch of things, but it seems really targeted for the scope that it could have impacted. They mentioned, yeah. I guess, right on the screen right now is affecting 13,000 of its customers and only looking for 600. Yeah, I found that pretty interesting when I was reading it too, because that suggests it's not really your run-of-the-mill malware campaign, right? It was it was targeted, uh, and that they kind of use that to their advantage too. I think they made a tool that would scan. So basically, how the uh, how the backdoor would know who to infect, it basically had a MD5 hash list of the 600 MAC addresses. So because of that, they were able to like scan your MAC address against that and see if you were one of the systems that was going to be targeted. Uh, and yeah, I, th I thought it was, that was pretty interesting. Like you said, that sounds more like a nation state level thing or something like that, or targeting a specific business. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's just like, like if it was after money, there's a clear, like they could go after everybody then. By yeah. targeting it, it just raises some questions over the actor that was behind this. I don't know enough to actually give any idea who it was or like anything like that. Like I said, nation safe, but I mean, could literally just be the mob targeting somebody, or it could be, you know, just an individual, who, you know, proof of concept. Yeah, I totally control this and here's some proof and then never got any further than that. Or maybe it was exploited. Uh, in more depth initially, and then they just dropped it down to 600 afterwards. Like, there's a lot of possibilities here. So, I don't know. It, it definitely wasn't a proof of concept, so I did actually read into it a bit more. Um, so, the technical details are supposedly going to be released next month. But what I, what I found was they, they dubbed this attack Shadow Hammer, and... From what I saw, the group that supposedly uh, like wrote this backdoor was named Shadowpad. I don't know if you've heard of that name before, but apparently they launched an attack against C uh, CC Cleaner or C Cleaner, however you say it, uh, and that is supposedly how they got access to the digital certificates for ASUS's uh, uh, update system. So yeah, it's so kind it's... of like a traversal from C Cleaner to ASUS. It's maybe worth mentioning also that it looks like the certificate, it is a code signing certificate, but it's not like their regularly used certificate. Oh, okay. Uh, it's believed to have come that. from somewhere down the supply chain. Okay. Because uh, the certificate was made in, uh, it's mentioned this article made in mid-2018, but different yeah. from what they regularly used as their code signing certificate. So like it's a valid code signing cert, it's just not their normal one. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because uh, in regards to who would be doing it, like, I feel like digital certs are not incredibly easy to get a hold of. So whoever is doing if this... If you're internal, it, has... it might be easier than you think, especially if this isn't one of their usual uh, code signing certificates. Like, it sounds like they think this came from like just part of the supply chain and not actually right out of ASUS. Yeah. But it's definitely like if you're if you're just trying to run a malware campaign, there's easier ways to do it than this. Right? So that that's kind of that's kind of what I was meaning by just it. it yeah. I mean the, it generally like getting the certificates taking an insider at some point. Yeah. And that means it's not purely digital anymore. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if people want to dig into that, maybe when more details come out next month, you know, we might have more to say, but I think at this point we could probably just leave it with I know what's been said here. There's obviously a lot of news reporting on this same issue. I don't think we'll be adding too much to that discussion. Yeah, just something interesting to bring up yep. and that we didn't bring up on the last podcast. So now, now we've got that covered, you know, uh, we can move on to. Uh, the Windows Defender stuff. So I thought this was pretty interesting. So this was posted uh, 25th of March. So there's version 1809, which basically just got released like within the last couple of weeks. I think that I updated to that last week. Uh, they added some instrumentation to the kernel to try to trace uh, code injection into user land processes from the kernel. And, you know, part of the reason they did that is because uh, 
if you remember the NSA exploits, uh, one of them was double par- pulsar, and uh, what th- what they did with that was they injected code from userland from the kernel. So they used a, an exploit to get kernel code execution through the server message block stuff, uh, SMB, and then once they got that, they injected code into userland processes from kernel to do their you know post exploit stuff and whatnot, um, and because typically you expect the kernel to be like you trust the integrity of the kernel you know these attacks could happen and there would be nothing that would kind of tip you off that anything weird was happening uh, you know kernel you expect it to be from microsoft if it wants to inject code in the user land processes you typically you don't really care like you think it's doing whatever it needs to do for operation um but this new instrumentation actually adds it, so it basically alerts you if the kernel's trying to inject code into a user land process. It sounds like it's um, also like kind of requiring it to have that asynchronous process call, the APC, uh, yeah. as being part of it. So not just injected, but uh, then the kernel's also initiating the call to it. And it yeah. seems like that's kind of what's being detected. Yeah, and this is the alert that it shows. So injection of potentially malicious code from the kernel. See, and we kind of talked about it last week, but this is the type of stuff that I just, I can't see them bringing across to OS X. Like, they don't have the internal access to do something like that on OS X for their Mac version. I know we talked about that last week. We don't have to get back into it. I just want to say, like, Defender does some really cool stuff on Windows, by moving that elsewhere, I just don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, what I what I think I found most interesting about this is typically when you're talking or when you're talking about chain of trust, kernel's near the top. Like the only thing that's really above kernel is maybe hypervisor or something like that, uh, or like trust zone. Um, but this is kind of like going against the typical tr- chain of trust. It's user land not trusting the kernel. So I thought that was kind of cool. It's not something that you really think about. Well, is the sensor, though, not also in the kernel? I'm not sure of the technical details, because that is something interesting, right? The sensor should, in theory, be able to be compromised. So I don't really know how that... I mean, I imagine there are sensors around the sensor, too, and then sensors around the sensor of the sensor. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question, though. Like, that is something that I think would be... uh, cool to know but, yeah i mean it really comes down to who's able to load first you know malware yeah. always trying to kind of get in there earlier to backdoor everything and you know the os the kernel hypervisor whatever trying to load before that and the arms race so obviously you've got like trusted platform uh module and stuff to try and uh, prevent anything from injecting too early and i imagine yeah. that's where they'd have some protection around some of the defender stuff yeah. Uh, so, yeah, moving on from that, we uh, have the stream cipher backdooring technique. Uh, yeah, I, don't know if I, I you saw You want to take that away? Because, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'm not sure you are. It's definitely kind of a more math heavy paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we actually want to. I mean, we could jump into the paper here quickly. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting. And I'm just going to talk about it in brief here. Uh, it basically is a release of a cipher. Uh, what are they calling it? BSEA, I think. BSEA, yeah. BSEA yeah. one. Yeah, which is literally stands for like backdoor stream stream encryption algorithm one. So this isn't something that you're actually going to be using. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, just looking into the idea of backdooring a stream cipher that still meets a lot of our normal standards for an acceptable crypto algorithm so it's looking at you know how much randomness are there in the bips like there's kind of a whole standard uh fips 140-2 uh which kind of gives a certain test that you run against the output looking just for things like um uh, statistically random like there should be the difference between a zero and a one popping up in the bit stream should be 50 percent it should just okay like it should be distributed normally so i mean th- there's just a lot of stats behind it and it this maintains a lot of the normal attributes so 
uh, all of the feedback polynomials are, or the degrees of them are co-prime. So co-prime basically just means like there's no common factors between them. It just has a bunch of nice mathematical features. It's what you'd expect to be used here. You're not going to use a number that's really easily divided. Um, in fact, all of the numbers that they use are uh, prime in general too. So and the initial value, strong randomness when it starts up, basically it looks like a good cipher, uh, but what happens, and this is something that if somebody's more interested, you could dig into the article, uh, but essentially, even though the numbers are random, if you start looking at them in groups, uh, so I believe, uh, so it's essentially the uh, Walsh function of the bit stream, uh, gives, basically there's only 16 possibilities for any group of 256 bits. Uh, so it really reduces the space just on kind of like looking at the bigger picture of it. Um, okay. I don't know. I mean, people can definitely dig into this. It's not super related to what we usually talk about. I just thought it was a really interesting concept, especially because this is looking at a stream cipher and not at a block cipher. Block ciphers, people have definitely looked at backdooring those. As far as I know, there hasn't been too much research into doing the same with stream ciphers. Um, so at I mean, a higher level, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's uh, one of those things where, you know, in the past, like uh, the NSA did release like some elliptic curves for a uh, crypto algorithm that they could break, but that nobody else knew how to break. So like it, yeah. it is a risk of like backdoors being introduced. And obviously there's a lot of talk about having backdoors in crypto. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what's the like big high level differences between a stream cipher and a block cipher? Is it more just essentially a block cipher? You've got blocks of whatever size, so like it's going to encrypt two hundred and fifty six bits at a time. So if you remember when we talked earlier about that padding issue, that's because yeah. the block cipher needs to deal with data in block sizes. It deals with this block, and then it deals with the next block, and the next block of data pads it out if it needs to. You know, and there's different algorithms for doing that padding. But, you know, it deals with the block, whereas the stream cipher is just kind of this running key. Okay. Uh, just dealing with, like, bit by bit or, like, just continually like that. It doesn't have blocks at all. Okay. Yeah, so basically what BSEA1 is is a subtle way of introducing a backdoor, like a mathematical backdoor into the crypto? That's correct. It's exactly okay. that. It's a broken algorithm that passes all of the normal tests for a secure crypto. Yeah, so I guess that does introduce that discussion of do we want backdoors in crypto? Because... I mean, obviously, like, this one, um, no, like, we wouldn't want this one because it's obviously well-known. Do we want it in <laughs> general? I, I would argue no, because somebody's going to find it. I mean, yeah. once somebody were to look at some of these algorithms, like, they'll figure out... That's why one of the big things that you look at when adopting a new crypto system is... Has this been examined by uh, mathematicians? Has this been looked yeah. at by the people that really need to? Which is not me, to be clear. Uh, I yeah, have like a, a basic understanding either. of of this from like university, but like I wouldn't trust myself to actually do a mathematical analysis of any sort of crypto system. But you're looking for that, and you're looking for it to have lasted, you know, ten years, and nobody's found a significant break. Mm -hmm. or a significant break that impact that's like practical also yeah uh so yeah. with back doors i mean it comes down to can we trust the government we're usually talking about the government introducing a back door can we trust them to keep it secret and uh, if mean, it's going to be getting used if i just feel like we can't do that I mean, even further than that, it's just that even if the government is like Halo, you know, they're they're going to be they're only going to use it when it's needed. They're not going to abuse it, stuff like that. They're going to keep it secret. You know, there is a chance that some other foreign nation state, for example, could find that backdoor and use it for themselves. Oh, absolutely. And could you even know? Like these backdoors are so subtle that it's like it's it's introducing it's kind of like having it like your house and you lock your door, but you put your key under the mat. You know, if you tell somebody the key is under the mat, sure they'll know. And you don't tell anyone else, but you know, other people might look there. Like it's, it's just, 
it seems like uh, something that you won't be able to get back in the box once you open it. Like, yeah, no, if, and that's that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, like it is something start... where, and that is the thing. Like with all of these algorithms, people are going to be looking at it. Um, oh yeah. In in the modern world, I I don't think somebody would be able to get away with a backdoor that isn't uncovered. Um, I mean, it just seems like now there's so many people looking at these things. It's not like the algorithm isn't as protected as it was like, you know, 90s, you know, the crypto wars and stuff. Um, yeah. You know, coming down to now, like it's going to be looked at. I even find it hard to believe that a backdoor would be implemented that wouldn't be caught within, say, five to ten years. Is it possible by, like, government, especially, like, the NSA or something? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, if, if there's thing, anybody that's going to kind of know the advanced math that we just don't know yet, and so the public wouldn't be able to break, it would be, you know, the NSA or some, like, government like that. So there's definitely the chance. It just... I don't know. I... I mean, I don't, I don't support it in any way. I just, I don't yeah. think it would actually work in today's world. But at the same time, maybe they are just so far advanced that it could. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. And part of the problem is, I think, once we, if we start allowing backdoors in some crypto uh, to go out there, then it's just, you're never going to get it back to where it was, right? That's just going to be the new standard. And it's, I yeah, I don't think that's the right way to go. I don't know about that. I mean, even though once it's out of the bag, if it once there comes down to that issue where somebody else has broken it, it's caused a very significant uh situation, let's say. I mean, people can change out crypto algorithms. Crypto algorithms do change all the time. Well, maybe not all the time, but they do change you know, MD5 for hashing passwords versus Bcrypt and Argon and all that now. I mean, like, I mean things you're... go forward. And TLS for, like, HTTPS yeah. stuff from SSL. So, like, if I think we could go back. I mean, the governments might not want to go back, though. And, I mean, on the legal side, I could agree. Like, once it's out of the bay yeah, where that's... they get all that power, it will yeah, be hard to have them what I step mean. back. Oh, okay. Like, you know, if there's like some backdoored crypto algorithm and then there's a non backdoored one, what if they just say, well, fuck it, that illegal one is, or that other one is illegal now? Uh, you can't use that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, that, that I think is a real concern. The government just kind of keeps growing in power and yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there was something else I was thinking about. I was just thinking about, uh, uh, I, actually, no, I think that covers pretty much everything. Yeah, yeah, so that's... then I think the next topic here is this Locker Goga. Looks like a ransomware bug. Or a bug in the ransomware so that you can kind of vaccinate yourself against the uh, ransomware. Um, in this case, pretty simple bug in there. It's uh, have a shortcut in .lnk file that points to an invalid location and it crashes. A straightforward bug, just you know, create that profile or create that shortcut and now the malware can't infect you until it's patched, of course. I, uh, I think we should note, do you think uh, that uh, PC vaccines cause autism for the uh, PCs? You know, since I was <laughs> experimenting with doing things like uh, running VBox service.exe, just like a fake one, so it would look like a VM, my machine has been acting more autistic. <laughs> uh, no, but, but yeah. I mean seriously, it it's been an interesting area of research. I don't think there's a lot of potential in these malware vaccines, at least not for like the individual user. Could I see like a you know malware, sorry, anti-malware provider, you know, automatically doing some of these little things? Yeah, I I could see them kind of doing that, but the whole idea of vaccinating against certain viruses, there's put there's the idea of potential. I just don't think it's going to be practical at all. Uh, the two cases I can kind of think of are like the, I just mentioned VBox service.exe. So you look like you're running inside of VirtualBox with the uh, user editions installed. 
Um, yeah. It's just a really simple check that the malware would do. Like, oh, is this processor? Then we're probably in a VM, so don't do anything bad. Uh, similarly, like Conflicker, you could install or you can add the mutexes that it, used, that it would use. And then it would yeah. see itself as already being installed and it wouldn't or it couldn't go further or if you keep the lock on i'm not actually not sure on that one if it would just see the mutex and not go f further or if you just kept the mutex locked either way like these things like there's there's so many uh viruses that come out no person could really keep up with them yeah i mean that's a fair point i i don't think it's incredibly practical but i do think it is really cool I think the idea of exploiting malware is just like it's just a it's just a really cool application of exploitation, right? Because when you think about exploits, it's mainly for malware to use. So using it kind of against itself is like I just I love that idea. Yeah, I mean uh, malware though would use this too. You know, one maybe not for ransomware. I'm not I haven't really looked into the ransomware deployments, but um bot killing you know you infect a machine and then you try and vaccinate it or kill all the other uh bots that may have also infected that machine like i mean malware oh, yeah, would use definitely. these things too to defend against other malware taking over the machine that they've already infected uh, i mean it it is interesting i i kind of like these bugs just because they are they're fun little they're fun. things that's like yeah. they're you know hey it's broken in this way so abuse that and I mean, sometimes you can't even exploit the malware. I don't have any thoughts in mind right now, like examples of it, but it's definitely happened. And yeah. I mean, I know it used to be able to most certainly still can, like just some kid's rat. They'll go back and they'll have like their email password sitting in it. <laughs> so it could email the logs back. Yeah, I, th I think WannaCry was fixed by that, wasn't it? Wasn't it like a mutex or something that they uh, that they grabbed sure. to lock? I forget what it was. I, I mean, it definitely could be. Sounds like a Conflicker kind of did that same thing, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it is really cool. I was trying to, like, brainstorm a little bit. Like, could mal anti-malware do this? Uh, like, just try to exploit programs that come in, but that would just be stupid because any normal programs that the user downloads that's not malware if they have bugs and those would crash too and that doesn't really help you at all <laughs> so yeah i mean it's hard to like think of how you could employ it practically in mo in most cases uh it is just one of those things where it's fun like it's 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 neat yeah i mean it's definitely like when you find them it's just kind of like something you just have to kind of smile and laugh at yeah uh so yeah Though this that, next we'll... issue isn't something that I necessarily would smile and laugh at, although perhaps that would uh, reduce its effectiveness if you were to be laughing, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, basically an acoustic side channel for hearing somebody as they type their pin in or as they type a word. Uh, yeah, so, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I've seen kind of a similar thing that used the accelerometer to kind of measure or to try and figure out where they were tapping. Uh, it's an acoustic one is definitely interesting also. Uh, in this case, though, it's worth noting it's a small sample size, only 45. Okay. Uh, like, uh, not attempts, but like people doing things, like sections, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, and the success rate, meh. I, I, I noticed the success rate was pretty, it was like, what was it, 50 or 60%? Or something uh, 61% like of four-digit pins within 20 attempts. Yeah. And nine that's... words of seven to 13 letters within 50 attempts on the phone. So the, uh, the pin was on the tablet and words were used on the phone. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it is really cool. Like, uh, I, I saw it mentioned that it would determine, like, where the location of the tap was based on like the travel time of the audio or whatever it was. Uh, it's a really cool attack and it reminds me of, uh, I remember there was something mentioned with the hard drive, like led indicator. You could like try to steal data, exfil data from that. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, there's, the, it was there's a bunch of air gap attack, air gap attacks to try and exfil data over an air gap. And that hard yeah. drive led was one of them. Yeah, so that kind of reminds me, uh, like, this kind of reminds me of that. Uh, 
I think it is a really interesting area to research and I feel like it's going to become more popular as time goes on like these kinds of attacks just because they don't rely like they they rely on like real more real world attacks right less on the technical side and more on like you know the physical actions actually happening uh that being said you know that success rate is kind of a like kind of makes me wonder how practical these attacks are like i i haven't looked at it's many worth of the noting attacks. this is kind of like you know you can think of this as that proof of concept yeah this is the first attempt at it so yeah the rates are definitely kind of low at the same time within 20 20 attempts compared to within you know a thousand attempts like 20 attempts is pretty small yeah it definitely narrows it down or 50 um. 50 attempts on like the words like that is a huge difference uh and this is without any previous training too yeah yeah i mean i i just wonder like if it's possible to increase that rate from 61 percent to like 80 percent or 90 percent because if you can then that is pretty crazy that is like an attack that you could actually like uh use right like you, i yeah, guess you I could argue know. this like i mean it, yeah. it's an attack i think if it's explored further possibly i imagine the biggest thing will actually be training like noticing certain features on certain phones and having data that's applicable to a particular phone um, yeah, or finding some way to train that. And I mean, getting that training might just be something like being able to see SMS messages being typed. Maybe that's not a good example since Google is trying to lock down access to that. But yeah. like there are ways that can get you can maliciously get that training. Yeah, because I remember one thing I did read was, uh, you know certain phones because of the thickness of the glass and all that kind of stuff that that would mess with the uh, uh attack uh like thicker glass i think they said had issues because this the sound traveled differently or something like that over the medium um, yeah which i mean if they get data for that thicker glass though it could it could be made more reliable yeah yeah I, yeah uh and i guess yeah and i i guess getting the phone's model wouldn't be like a big like a great feat it'd be fairly easy to get no a but getting the data access. for it the training for it would be more of a feat yeah you know doing that with every single phone is a bit excessive for most attackers yeah um i wonder how much like because i know it, it mainly tries to pull the audio from the glass right but like how much does conversation in the room and like uh ambient noise mess with the the results as well i'd have to imagine they probably, i have to imagine it has a pretty significant effect yeah like they, they probably talk about it a little bit more in here but i haven't read the full thing because it's like 23 pages but yeah, uh, they really go into their methodology there i don't think uh, yeah, actually, actually right here they say they had place uh, windows open letting in ambient noise that was yeah luck. i didn't even but try to they don't there. really give more information about the ambient noise like what level it was uh, yeah. They just mentioned, like, in a common room, like, you're at the paragraph there, in the common room, the reading room, library. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those things that's neat, but definitely needs more exploration. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to the next thing, uh, Keybase and, and uh, Tofu. Yes. Tofu. Trust on I, first I use. I hate Tofu. I, I you hate that. trust on first use. Do you prefer trust on second use? No, Tofu food. <laughs> Yeah, um, so, I mean, kind of a quick rundown. Initially, this was posted actually calling out Signal and WhatsApp as being soft as tofu rather than Keybase isn't soft as tofu. And, I yeah, mean, it's just I, Keybase I here, pointing out um, kind of a common issue on these uh, encrypted chats, which is not so much trust on first use because i mean trust on first use isn't a bad thing it's the same thing you get with like ssh first time you connect like do you want to trust this fingerprint yes you normally do and it warns you as soon as that fingerprint changes with like this big thing and add it to the host file and like makes a really big deal out of the key changing yeah. which it should do i mean because that's a good sign of a serious misconfiguration from the server admin or that you're actually being attacked, like man in the middle. So, like, it's a big deal. Uh, yeah, I guess were... the issue... Sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, yeah, they were talking a little bit about that here with uh, whatever app this was, uh, where instead of making a big deal out of it, like you were talking about with SSH, it just put a little shield message there that you could like in the, like the smallest font or next to the smallest font, and then it just continued. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of their issue. Is it still trusts new devices. It just notes like, hey, this thing has changed, but, you know, one, they still have access to all the past messages. So, like, it doesn't matter if you don't trust it. Yeah. I mean, all that old stuff has still been there, which is where Keybase kind of has their solution as just being like a chain of keys. Like, your old device will sign the key of the new device, and then they can share the secrets through, you know, have one having that signed key. So, like, the device you trust tells the other devices they can trust it. And if it doesn't do that, Keybase has a really significant warning that can show up and be like, hold up, you probably, you know, check this out because this person has changed all their keys. Yep, and uh, that actually happened very recently to me. Uh, something happened with Keybase. I don't know what it was. Uh, I tried logging in, I think, like a week ago or so. And it was telling me to authenticate this device being my desktop with an existing device that I had already logged in with. But the problem was the existing device it listed was the PC I'm on. So like, I don't really know what happened, but something happened where it didn't recognize the PC. And uh, yeah, because of that, you know, my keys changed. I had to basically nuke the account. So everyone who followed me on key Keybase was no longer following me. Everyone I followed, I was no longer following. Um, everyone I'd ever had a conversation with there was like a big red screen on saying, you know, don't trust me anymore. <laughs> uh, and, and I lost. I stopped trusting you. Yep. And uh, I lost conversation history with everyone. So it was, I, I will say it was a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> but yeah, I guess but it I mean, should it be a pain in the ass? And I mean, I definitely would argue, yes, you're using this for a reason. You're using encrypted chat for a reason. It's not for the convenience. That, that's true. Like, I guess I don't use Keybase for my everyday chat. I use Discord or whatever, right? So Keybase is only for things that you want to keep secret. So I can see that. That's that's good. a good, uh, like, point on that. Yeah, I mean, it's there's not too much more to really say there. Just, you know, a little write-up yeah. out of Keybase about kind of how they go about it and why they're different. Um, yeah. Uh, and I wanted to know a little bit more about Tofu, so I, I just thought I'd bring this up because it was kind of funny. I looked it up, and it said, The single largest strength of any Tofu-style model is that a human being must initially validate every interaction. And then right under it, it said, The largest weakness of any Tofu-style model is that a human being must initially validate every interaction. <laughs> Which is fair. So, it, is, yeah. it is both a asset and a weakness. Yeah. Or at least it can be weak. Yeah. So th th that's the big red message that I was talking about before. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's a kind of interesting post, right? It It is kind of that convenience versus security thing. But like you said, where you are using Keybase generally because you want to be more secure, I guess security really wins out there compared to convenience in, in this case. Yeah, like, I mean, I'd say in that case, like, you're wanting to protect your messages from somebody else. Yeah. You have to deal with some inconvenience, and I don't think that big warning is really that much of an issue. Yeah. yeah under normal use, at least. And it is yeah, worth just... a big warning. Yeah, it just sucks with the losing the message history, honestly. I was, like, <laughs> the thing that sucked for me, but... Um, but, yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, to so, bring up, so. Uh, I mean, moving on with this next one here, finally getting into some of the exploit kind of mitigations here is this Intel processor trace technology. Uh, essentially, like the processor trace is like this um, runtime control flow tracing is essentially what like PT does, which is interesting. It's obviously only Intel. Uh, and then this is looking at using control flow tracing to detect data-oriented attacks. So, like, your data-oriented attacks are basically attacks that don't violate your control flow integrity. Or that don't yeah. really have any control flow effects. Like, they're not attacking the control flow, they're 
just changing the application data. So like Heartbleed uh, never violates CFI, but it does obviously leak a bunch of data. Yeah, it's basically data only attacks. Like you're not taking control of, you're not getting code execution per se. Well, so you like, can, like that something. is where DOP comes in. You know, more generalized, there are attacks, you know, finding your uh, data oriented gadgets that do like uh, assignment, arithmetic conditionals, you know, basically Turing complete. And then you're able to find, you find a dispatcher similar to job. It's not like a jump table. Uh, okay. But there is an attack actually for, or like a generalized attack of data oriented programming that can be okay. kind of more expressive than just kind of internal, like turning yourself from user to admin and like changing that data. Yeah. Um, and that's actually what this thing kind of focuses on, trying to detect those by using the side effects of some of these attacks. So when you change those values, the control flow might all be legitimate but it might not be normal. So what it tries to do is it'll detect like incompatible branch behaviors. So like when you branch between two different functions and like, you know, it notices that every time you enter this function, if it does this branch, it always does this other branch and then it doesn't. That's an abnormality it will detect. Or if a certain function is kind of abnormally frequently hit, that's another thing it'll detect. It won't necessarily detect things like corrupting the configuration or like setting yourself as an admin or information disclosure but it will detect some of those attacks which i mean it's just because obviously this processor trace is meant to look at control flow and these aren't control f taking huge advantage of the control flow at least not until like something really obvious uh so yeah so. i mean i do wonder about false positives though like you were saying like you know um it'll try to hit branches or it'll try to detect branches that are never taken or aren't taken often you know what if it what if it misses a case where it does actually take it well so it uses the runtime to kind of figure out what that baseline is okay uh similar to like because it actually looks at like the branch prediction table and all of that uh so it kind of knows the history of everything that it's able to derive from yeah. So, I mean, it is, though, uh, abnormalities. It's not actually detecting the attack. It's detecting that something abnormal happened. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily an issue. It just means, like, it develops this correlation in the normal flow and tells you when something goes wrong from there, which can be used to detect these things, can be a false positive. Uh, yeah. But just an interesting approach to... Kind of detecting those because this is data oriented attacks and uh pt is definitely not looking at the data just control flow but yeah using kind of the side yeah. effects of them to detect that so like i said if, when they're incompatible branch behavior or unusual things yeah uh now one thing i did see though is that some of these defenses do have quite a significant overhead uh yeah, of like course. data yeah. flow integrity. Yeah, but like four hundred to six hundred percent. Like that's crazy. Um, but like, yeah. I mean, do you think that these mitigations are worth that overhead? At this point, no, no. I mean, it's not going to be adopted yet. But I mean, this is research. This is what yeah. might be coming. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, that's where I think it's important. Like. Yeah, right now this totally isn't uh, coming in, but or like this isn't going to be adopted. Six hundred percent whole program issue, like no way. Yeah, and I, and I guess the other thing that's interesting too is, uh, like so this is enforced at the CPU level. Like this is enforced. Well, so it's not even really enforced. Um, it's it's just detected at. Kind of the CPU level, yeah. Okay. Because so I'm just trying to think of like how, like if that, if the integrity of that, uh, of the mechanisms that do the checking can be trusted, right? That like, I, I don't have an answer for you on. Yeah. Like I didn't look too much into that, just kind of the big picture of what it was trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. Like, I, 
I, I'll be honest, uh, in the exploitation I've done, I, I've never really needed to do any data-oriented programming. I've never needed to do data-only attacks. It's always been about like hijacking control flow. I've never had to deal with CFI, per se. Which uh, is fair. I mean, even like the whole stuff on DOP is fairly recent. Like, I want to say last couple years or so. Yeah. Is where you kind of had like the advance of DOF come out. Like obviously DOF has been around much longer, like just the data oriented stuff. Yeah. Uh but yeah, May 2016th was the kind of the whole expressiveness thing that I was mentioning before, getting that Turing complete was when yeah. that was presented. Yeah. But uh yeah, do you do you have any more to add on the uh No, on the stuff? no I think that's no. the gist okay. of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I just didn't. I don't want to go too deep into it because, like, it's it's like fifteen pages of highly technical stuff, and honestly, where I don't do much data oriented programming, I just don't yeah, really think I, I have mean, much more to add. What I feel is that it's worth kind of coming up, bringing it up here, because you know, maybe in the future, this is going to be something that is kind of optimized and used. So you know, we're covering it now. We'll cover it later too. I hope not. <laughs> I hope this dies. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with this stuff. Uh. But yeah, I'll just hold out that that hope. But you're probably <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, like, if right. CFI comes more, like, it it matters. So I think yeah. it's worth, like, this is something new coming out. Let's take a look at it. Uh, which yeah. is kind of with this next one uh, coming up here. Uh, I mean, this is another case of you kind of being some big news. Another Spectre defense. Uh, yeah, of, uh, I'm restricting popular, control flow ahead. during speculative execution with Venkman. Uh, since he brought the performance on the last one, this one also doesn't have very good performance. So this is oh, another really? thing. Okay. I didn't see that on this one. Yeah, I mean, it's mixed, but this is like system wide. Like this is like you need to recompile the entire system to have everything aligned correctly. Like the gist of this one is that uh, it completely thwarts the Spectre attacks that poison entries in the branch target buffer or the return stack buffer. Uh, and essentially it does that by every branch target. So every time you branch somewhere, have a conditional, every time you return, every address needs to be on, uh, I think their default or like the example given was on a 32, like aligned to 32 bits or bytes, yeah. sorry. Uh, like they say, it just needs to be uh, aligned at an address divisible by, or sorry, the blocks will be a size of power of two, and they need to be aligned by that same power of two. Uh, yeah. and essentially, it moves all the code like that, adds in some protective code at the beginning of every block that needs to be protected. Uh, so if you have, like, you know, some that injects a load fence before, like, a load injection, uh, those all have, those have to happen in the same block. Um, any protection and stuff like that. So it's like a huge system-wide code recom recompilation that adds on extra um, instructions with like every branch. So it's not very performant. Yeah. So like obviously the, the reason this is big news, right, is because of like all those speculative execution attacks that happened not too long ago, like Spectre and, and Meltdown and whatnot. They kind of shook the industry because it wasn't just something that you could patch in like within 90 days and just say, okay, yeah, it's all good now. It's basically like an architectural flaw with how CPUs work. And because, you know, they need that speculative execution for that performance boost that they're going for. Uh, and there were issues like they tried issuing patches. I remember to like Linux and stuff like that when it hit the news and whatnot. And the patches were garbage. Uh, they would like completely mess with performance, probably more so than even like load fences and stuff do. Uh, so a lot of people didn't like them. So this white paper's like kind of interesting in regards to that. So I don't do. Like, I don't do much with, like, at the CPU level, right? Like, I'm not a hardware person. Uh, it'd be cool if we could actually get a hardware person on to talk about this a little bit more. But, uh, you know, I, I looked into a bit more about load fences. So as far as I understand, load fences are basically, they check the flags and for, like, memory modifications and stuff like that before executing the next instruction. So 
that that's basically what a load fence is, right? Do I have that wrong or I think that's the gist of it. Yeah. So like obviously there is a performance hit there because you know they have to do those checks and stuff like that. Yeah, to be um, clear, this isn't actually like protection against all of like the Spectre attack. This is specifically those that poison entries in the branch target buffer and the RSP. Um, yeah, it, it's not every attack. It's just those types of attacks that would use like a. Uh, the idea with that is that they would target. Uh, either one of those buffers basically by inserting an address that's valid within their address space but not in another address space and then yeah. in that victim address space is where it would actually be exploited yeah uh, but it's worth knowing like this is just a subset of the attacks it's not a specter solution yeah so it yeah because it's not really a problem that you can solve all in one pretty bundle right because it's just such maybe such you a can large issue maybe yeah maybe we just need to invent a time machine and get somebody to come from the future to fix it now that's 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 the way and to tell fix us it. how it gets fixed that's that's the solution yeah um no but yeah i think it is pretty interesting using alignment to try to fix against those issues like trying to uh, like uh trying to prevent bypassing the fence by aligning them to uh, 32 byte boundaries um it is. I do wonder, though, you know, what are the odds of an invalid jump still being correctly aligned? It sounds like that would be pretty low, but I mean, yeah, you know, system wide, maybe. The other thing is, um, I my understanding is that this will actually load things into a smaller address space also. Uh, so it kind of messes with ASLR. I don't know how big the hit on that was. Wasn't super clear, uh, but it's. Uh -huh. I don't think it mentions it directly. It was just like I noticed it mentioned that it had a smaller oh, okay. address space. Um, it doesn't actually talk about ASLR at all. Okay. Uh, but that's another kind of impact here is, you know, you're losing some there. Maybe since 64 bits, maybe it's only like a handful of bits that are lost and it's still okay. But I mean, there, there are some definite issues here besides just performance. That's an interesting thing. Like I didn't, I didn't see anything about, or like, I didn't think about that with like it potentially impacting ASLR. That's an interesting point. Uh, it's not something you really think about when you're talking about trying to protect against uh, speculative execution. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, it's um, just that is uh, like a side effect here is, you know, we're introducing this, but what side effects come in that kind of undermine it you know if you're folk if you're too focused on just one aspect of the security you know there's all these other vulnerabilities too and i feel like this one while it is kind of an interesting take on it just by like aligning everything it's i think just way too infeasible to actually uh put in place i don't remember what the performance was of it but i do remember that it was a pretty significant like the number that's sticking in my head is like three hundred percent. Okay. But I don't, I don't have it written down here, so I could be incorrect about that. So you don't think that this Venkman thing is going to really take off in terms? No, of... I mean it's a new architecture idea here. It's not something that I think will get adopted. Yeah, so I guess the main thing is is there's things that could be learned from the paper that could be experimented with, but I guess it's not, you know, it's not going to be a fixed. wholesale. It's not it's like a, it's research. Yeah, and I don't have but, a solution to this either. So like I can hate on this <laughs> I all either. I want. I don't have like it's not really my area, and at least somebody's looking at it. Yeah, it, it would be I'll cool just to get a hardware it. person on. Yeah. <laughs> uh. But that does make me wonder. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't really do CPU stuff, so it's not incredibly easy for us to answer. But do you? How long do you think it is before speculative execution is mostly handled, in terms of years? I really don't know. I mean, I I have a feeling we might even decide that we're okay with that. Really? I mean, I'm not saying that that's necessarily my position. I think there's huge security implications of it, but given kind of how slow some things move. I mean, some people might decide, like, yeah, it's it's there. We'd rather have performance than 
uh, security. I mean, that's a trade-off that I think might be made. But at the same yeah, time, like, th this comes down, like, what really matters are, like, these big server deployments. So at that, if they can come up with some performance solution in, like, the next three, five years when things are kind of up to be upgraded again. Yeah. In, like, the data center, uh, then... You know, maybe we'll see it adopted then. Obviously, this isn't a quick patch. People use machines for years and years. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's it's hard, especially because it's the CPU. Like, that's the one thing you want to be as performant as possible. You don't want any bottlenecks at that level because then any, like, slow issues that happen higher up are, like, compounded by it. So, yeah, like, I mean, it's... speculative execution is a huge performance gain. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't think I, yeah, I don't think anyone's going to want to trade that out for just because it's, yeah, yeah I can definitely see performance winning yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. No, just my initial thought on kind of how things have gone so far is I could definitely see the argument for performance winning out. I mean, personally, I'd rather see the security, I, but I guess it kind of, it does come down to what the performance hit and what we can figure out as a solution. Um, I don't know the answer right now. I imagine if we are going to see a replace, we're still looking like five years out, five to ten years at least, my, my thought is. I don't think we're going to see a quick adoption of anything that fixes it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair point. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty much everything covering this uh, white paper, right? I don't think there's uh, too much yeah, more Yeah, I mean, that's cover. sufficient. Obviously, people can read it. On their yeah, own, we'll have, there's a, an we'll have a link there. for all these in the description, yeah. so you can check it out. Uh, yeah, we'll yeah, have that's... to see about maybe getting somebody for like talking about speculative execution more because I think it is a topic that's really worth discussing. It's just I I don't think we have the particular like uh, expertise the to talk background about it. for it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely don't. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully we can get somebody on for that. But that's that's all we can talk about today uh that pretty much wraps up the podcast hopefully we're gonna have anti back for the next one uh he's just going through some stuff in in life right now so that's why he's been missing from this one and i think two podcasts ago so hopefully we'll we'll have him back on next week uh yeah, and i and should be around next week that's actually still up in the air so we'll get back on that but hopefully if i am still around we'll not have so many technical issues going on but Things don't seem to be wanting to work out for me anyhow, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, as usual, yeah, I, mean, I definitely want to welcome people. If you have questions, if you have something we you want to see us discuss, definitely bring it up either in chat during the stream or uh, preferably, you know, drop us a comment and let us know. And we'll, yeah. you know, maybe prepare something or, you know, like we took on a couple questions just during this stream. You know, definitely welcome the interaction. That way it's not just us talking to each other all the time. Yeah. Uh feel feel free to leave your critiques of uh Z's uh technical ability and I'm no, just kidding. Yeah, definitely, you know, <laughs> I, some questions have been raised that need to be answered about my abilities here. Yeah, you're on the chopping block. <laughs> yeah, I mean it might just be you next time. Yeah. And just talking to myself, talking to the void. Uh but yeah, that concludes this podcast. So we'll see you guys again perhaps next week depending on if c has everything you know if if he has to go to if not the week after we'll let you guys know through like twitter and, yeah. and whatnot. we should be back on our normal time yeah yeah back on mondays uh day zero instead of day one yep. uh, for, uh at 3 p.m eastern and 12 p.m pacific and uh yeah so that concludes this podcast and we'll see you guys then see you guys next time <laughs>